Hello, you two. I'm so excited to be able to chat today, Patricia, with you about our work in virtual cell models and with Shana with you about our uh, tissue engineering and work in inflammation. We can start with you, Shana. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, what you have been able to do at the Chicago Biohub. So about we've been up and running the Chicago Biohub for about a year and a half now. We've assembled a really outstanding team of scientists and engineers. And what's really exciting is they all have a singular focus on the problem of inflammation, yeah. a huge driver of, of human disease. And once we got the team there and going, we were trying to put our finger on what the major unmet needs are, just in terms of technological gaps that we needed to fill to start studying inflammation in new ways. And what we decided to attack as a first problem is being able to sense inflammation in real time in living tissue. And it was something that had never been done. We were looking to do that really at the molecular level. So we built a new class of sensors, really tiny, you know, think width of a human or a few human hairs, and uh, got them up and running, showed that we could implant them. These studies were, were done in animal models of inflammation, showed that we could implant the sensors, watch inflammation trend up, watch it trend down. And so what we now have is a new tool that allows us to look at inflammation as a function of disease state or diet or environment or you name it. So it's a really powerful new technology that we now have at our disposal. So when I think about inflammation, uh, one, I think about my old Chinese grandma who told me not to eat too much cold or hot foods to like to mess with my inflammation. But really, truly, she was kind of right in that inflammation really does underlie so much human disease, heart disease, Alzheimer's, pain. And so how how does what your microsensor do help us understand things like pain or arthritis or all those yeah. Uh, diseases that are caused by inflammation. Yeah, so it gives us a new way to look at the very early signs of inflammation, really before there's any disease that's resulted, mm -hmm. right? We can just watch inflammation happening in real time, hopefully learn how to turn it around so that we just never get to the point of having cardiovascular disease. Instead, we deal with the inflammation that maybe arises way before the disease is actually present. So that's the long-term view. Um, there's many other research questions that we can ask, uh, just in terms of looking at inflammation under all kinds of different conditions in different models, in our instrumented tissues, in humans and animals, uh, any living system. So that's all very exciting. And the way we develop the sensor, it's actually very similar uh, in form factor to a continuous glucose monitor. So yeah, the thing that we see yeah. on sort of the backs of people's arms. Exactly. Right? It's just a little microneedle that goes right under the skin okay. and it just sits there. It's not even in the blood stream. It's very non-invasive. And so we hope that this is something that eventually we will all be able to pull off the shelf if we want to know more about what's happening to us day to day in terms of our inflammatory profiles. We'll have a technology that'll give us more information. That's amazing. So right now you've developed a sensor that's the width of a few human hairs. What is it embedded in? What do you use it? How do you use it in the lab right now? Yeah, so we we take these microneedles. We have little devices that allow us to kind of insert them so that we can get them positioned. And then we take the insertion device away. Into like mice or uh, rats. engineered rats. Yeah. Okay. We like diabetic rats okay. are a good model for us. Um, but we are also starting to work with them in our instrumented tissue models. Okay. Um, but we get them implanted, you know, right under the skin. Uh, and then we have these little molecular sensors that are parked on the surface of the microneedle, and those are what feed us the information about the inflammation profiles. Interesting. So we still have to understand the profiles because, you know, uh, my understanding is that there's good inflammation, there's mm -hmm. bad inflammation, and then there's sort of really late inflammation. So are we, do we understand these profiles yet, or is that sort of what's next? That's what's coming. That's what's coming. So right now we know that there's acute inflammation, which we need if, you know, you step on a nail or you get a cut or you get stung by a bee, your immune system goes to work on that. Mm -hmm. And and that kind of inflammation we need to keep the body healthy. But it's inflammation that kind of creeps in because immune cells get dysregulated. They start attacking healthy tissue. That's what we really have to get a handle on. Mm -hmm. And hopefully with our sensors, we can look at that systemically to really understand more about how that evolves. I, I think that is part of what makes me so excited about what we're doing together is that we're building tools to make all different groups and all different doctors, scientists, 
be able to do their job more creatively better. Um, and like, you know, when we say at CZI, we want to cure, prevent and manage all disease by the end of the century, we're not doing it alone. It's like, well, how do we build tools, build resources that make everyone's work so much better? Um, and maybe that's a good segue to Patricia, your work in science technology and how we've been um, building uh, software tools, but now AI models to really try to both make uh, the time from idea to sort of scientific discovery a shorter time period and be able to share that with others. But maybe you can tell us a little bit more about our work in virtual cells. That's right. So about a year ago, we decided that we wanted to focus our efforts in science technology and using AI in new ways to accelerate research. Um, and maybe to sort of step back a little bit, there are two, I think, um, major aspects um, to this. One is improving and having less fragmentation about how science is done and disseminated. Mm -hmm. Um, there's an awful lot of science being published, but actually bringing it together to be able to say, you know, what is a universal representation of a cell? Or what is the state of what we actually know about how molecules are located in the cell? Yep. That's very uh, diffuse today. Yeah. So sort of like it's like the analogy where we're all blind individuals trying to examine an elephant. Yeah, exactly. And we're all describing something different. Like Correct. what are we even looking at together? Right. Um, and trying to have a unified way of saying, oh, that's definitely an elephant. Yeah. And then the other driver for this is that there's so much we still don't know. Um, yeah. You know, we talk about all these exciting developments and how much has been learned about the genome over the last 20, 25 years. But when it comes to the cell, there's okay. still so much unknown. And we believe that if we can bring together uh, data sets uh, investments in compute, actually being able to bring to bear the technology resources so that these vast amount of data can be analyzed in ways not possible in the way science is done today, um, that we'll get to these answers quicker. Um, so 2024 was all about um, getting going with this work, building a team, building our infrastructure, um, engaging with the community and getting out there and getting their input on what this vision for virtual cell might be. And we actually published a paper towards the end of the year that really uh, sort of lays out the vision or the manifesto for what uh, virtual cells can enable. Um, and we also delivered our first models. So this is the first time our internal science technology team have been building uh, models. So we have one model that's using the transcriptome data, and that is exploring what happens when you take an action or when you perturb um, a cell. Um, and this will, it's, it's early days, but this, this kind of work um, in understanding perturbations um, will help really understand what happens if you take an action, say, for example, in applying a disease or in um, making a change to a gene. Um, how that will affect the trajectory of that disease, for example. So maybe we can step back so that I sort of make sure that we have a shared understanding of like, what is a virtual cell? Because mm -hmm. I hear, like, I read things like there's like, people use words like digital twin, or they, in, they're they doing experiments in silica. What exactly do you mean when we say we're going to build a virtual cell? So when I say virtual cell, it really is a, it's a vision. And it's a vision of this idea of a, of a digital simulator. So imagine being able to do experiments in silico. So okay. today, Shana or her team go into the lab and they um, they do these experiments. And they, they have gather data and they're animals or cells. There's stuff. There's living Correct. stuff involved. Yes. Unpredictable um, living stuff. Yeah, yeah. Unpredictable. And the the idea with the virtual cell is that you have a representation of not just the cell, but the uh, molecules within the cell, and the um, and even some information about how those um, those molecules function. Yep. And then you can, if you will, ask questions or interact with it or take an action um, on that cell and then have the virtual system, the simulator, return some uh, results, analysis, protocols um, that then you can use to further inform your work or to actually take into a lab and test in a, um, a real life environment. So you're saving time um, by if you will, doing these virtual experiments yep. early, and then th that should help you hone in on what needs to be tested. So now. instead of having to take every single idea to the wet lab where things take time and uh, there are various supplies, lots of constraints, we can do experiments on a computer to test out a lot of ideas early on about how a, a mutation 
or a certain drug or a certain action you might take onto a cell, how that might change the cell itself. Exactly. And you can share those results uh, because it's all in, in a digital and interconnected. You can share those results more easily. And that's part of what we've done to build the platform or the infrastructure for people to share data and the models and begin to make those available to not just the computational researchers, mm-hmm. but also the experimental biologists who may, may not have as much of that uh, computational training. I guess one example that comes to mind is, you know, my mom has high blood pressure. Yep. Instead of testing out five different high blood pressure medications um, on someone like my mom, you could take them on in the computer setting and see which medication would help her the most or which medications would cause side effects for her. Correct. What uh, we have been working on building up to these models for a while now, because we've needed some foundational pieces to make this type of uh, modeling and AI research possible. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? Sure, absolutely. So I think there there are two aspects to that. One is data Mm -hmm. and data sets. And we have, over the last several years, aggregated and integrated uh, transcriptomic data. So these readouts that um, are of the cell. And we have now uh, just hit a milestone. We have over 100 million cells across all tissue types represented in that data set. Okay. And that now is being used by our internal researchers as well as external researchers all over the globe who are beginning to use that to build models and to um, explore some of these aspects of how do we build a, a virtual cell. The second big area is in compute. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the one of the things we've learned is that the academic and, and not-for-profit research community just does not have access to compute resources in the way that, say, large technology companies do today. And so we've uh, built what I think is one of the largest not-for-profit research clusters mm-hmm. um, to support our work, and that's being used all across the science ecosystem. But we also are now beginning to put that out for access to the broader research community. And so researchers will be able to submit proposals for projects that they would like to do using large amount of compute. So the constraint is projects that will require 100 GPUs, which is pretty pretty significant. And we're really excited about that. One, uh, it's a new kind of grant Mm -hmm. um, for -for not-for-profit research organizations, but it's also going to generate, uh, I think, a lot of interesting ideas, both that will help us on our journey for virtual cell work and also related to our other scientific goals. How do you, Shana, how do you imagine using something like the virtual cell for your research? I just see this massive acceleration in how we can generate data, how we can analyze data, And what that leads us to is faster breakthroughs, right? We can learn more faster. And that, I think, is really going to change the pace of science in a way that's really needed. And so that's what gets me really excited, is that instead of all of the very manual stuff that we do in the lab and the very manual data workup and the way that we try to compile literature together and understand what it all means and interpret data, we're going to have models that do that for us. And then we can kind of take that stepping stone and go to the next one and the next one and the next one much, much faster than we've ever been able to. Yeah, I'm hearing really how do we both speed up the way we acquire information and data and then how do we get meaning out of it faster? So Priscilla, when you think about AI, what do you think are some of the more exciting opportunities uh, in medicine, in research? Um, How do you think it's going to change the world? I think right now we... In biology, we either discover things by accident or we discover things that are convenient to study. And like we're real complex humans that have all sorts of interesting bits and uh, extra things or special things about each one of us that is unique to how our bodies work. And that if we have a way to sort of systematically understand biology, understand an individual, we can actually meet understand and meet the needs of each person and keep them healthy. And I think that that is so cool. And that being able to do that with a virtual cell and be able to run so many experiments and preemptively see what a person needs or how they might be affected by a certain medication or a change um, in their health, I think that that leads us to be able to keep people healthy instead of just treating them when they are sick. What you guys have talked about today is just the tip of the spear. And that means that we are primed to do great science and build tools that lift everyone up 
so that CCI can be part of cure, prevent, and managing all disease by the end of the century. So I'm so grateful for everything that you guys have done in building up our ability to contribute.